Thank you very much, Caroline, and uh, thank you all for coming and joining us for the 2021 Roy Palmer Lecture. Um, Roy Palmer was, as Caroline has indicated, one of England's most active and popular folklorists and song collectors. And his books and articles have introduced many people to the tales and songs of their region and of the country as a whole. But what fewer people knew was that he was an unselfish helper to many researchers and singers who sought to tap his store of knowledge. He died in 2015 and in the following year, an annual lecture series was instituted in his name to give a platform to speakers on an aspect of traditional song, music, folklore or popular culture and enable them to share their own knowledge in like fashion. Now, I'd like to thank the Folklore Society for hosting tonight's event. Roy was a folklorist of the old sort. His immensely readable books of county folklore, like his works on songs, were intended for the general public and gave people a good start to understanding the folklore of their area. And we felt that we should tonight shift our focus to this area of work, as well as the song which we usually cover. This is the sixth Roy Palmer lecture. Um, it was supposed to be the fifth, but COVID intervened, and I'm very glad that Jeremy Hart is finally able to give his talk. Um, Jeremy is well known to members of the Folklore Society, but perhaps less well known to others. He's uh, trained as a museum professional and is curator of the Bourne Hall Museum in Surrey. He researches the overlap between folklore and the landscape, especially places of encounter with the supernatural. And he gave a wonderful talk last week on uh, the devil in folklore. And he's written a number of books and he's a member of the Council of the Folklore Society. His talk is called Brother Workman, Solidarity in Trade Folklore. Before I ask him to deliver it, could I just take a moment to say we will be asking, yeah, we will be able to ask questions after the talk. Um, if you have a question, as Caroline has said, please type it into the chat, preceded by the word question, if you can. And I'll collect the questions and put them to Jeremy on your behalf. And so, without more ado, I, let's ask Jeremy, please give this year's Roy Palmer lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Brother Workman. This is the, um, the trade union gathering of 1830s. Um, distinguished um, in the way that they've presented it in this engraving by the disciplined solidarity of everybody who's present. And they're not just heading towards parliament, they're heading towards the future. This is the idea of unions being presented as a combination to a more democratic, a more efficient, a more just England. But the people who are actually standing there, the, the sort of little anonymous round heads in the rows, are coming from a different world, coming from a world of folk custom in which there are quite separate ways of expressing who you are um, in your life as a working man. And this is a kind of linking of themes held together by a tribute to Roy, and particularly a lot of the work he did in collecting song, in collecting the records of working lives, trying to take some of the folklore which is so disparate, tends to get a bit scattered in the books, and see if I can find common themes for it, which are going to make sense rather than interest out of folklore. One of the folklore themes that we haven't really explored, I think, in recent decades is epitaphs, which is fascinating because they are a kind of classic, accessible folk genre. Um, the typical kind of, you know, early, early 90s to mid to late 
consists of the, the necessary biographical information, which is rather conveniently distinguished here by the, um, the fonts used um, by, by the epitaph engraver, underneath which you've got what I think is kind of called the tag. Um, my sledge and hammer lies declined, my bellows too have lost their wind. This is the blacksmith's epitaph, and you find it all over the country. Um, whether it's being copied from little books that are, are making their way from hand to hand, or whether people are seeing it on one gravestone and memorizing it, whether in fact this is the work of the stonemason as a tribute to his colleagues, or whether blacksmiths in their last moments kind of turned over weakly and said, darling, I'm not long for this world, but could I have my sledge and hammer has declined on my gravestone, please? We don't know. What we do know is that it expresses the man's identity by what his trade was. There's this whole sense that when you're a blacksmith, when you're a fisherman, even down to a, a late 18th century epitaph to a stagecoach driver, you want to be memorialized as the kind of work that you have, the kind of thing you are. And that's also expressed through the physical identification with the tools. Um, it's not really, of course, his sledge and hammer that, that are lying, it's him that's lying in the dust, but the tool becomes a metonymy for the man. A fascinating thing about these as a folk genre is that like so many others, they're adopted. Um, the idea of writing epitaphs for tradesmen actually seems to begin in the 17th century as a kind of elite joke. Um, there are lots of books of you know, apparently spurious epitaphs circling where people take the opportunity to sum up somebody's lives as a chance for a pun or a bit of wordplay. And increasingly they start using the idea of plays of words on what somebody's trade was. And yet somewhere around about 1790s, 1810s, this is actually picked up and you start getting people genuinely identifying themselves by who they were. And the interesting thing, you know, you, you glance down this one uh, and you notice that it's actually clearly arrived not from performance, but from a written original. Because in the dust my vice is laid, is the original. Voice here has been written by somebody who isn't a blacksmith and doesn't realize, I, I don't know, unless the late Samuel Wright had vices of another kind, didn't realize this wasn't something that you wanted to celebrate. So you get stuff like this flat back, um, just showing here he is, he's a blacksmith. I kind of think, even though it says blacksmith at the bottom, um, the way he's wearing that cap means he might double up as a Gretna Green blacksmith. So you've got all kinds of links to other folklore traditions here. But the thing is, the man, the man, the tool, the hammer, and the job are one. And you look, you look at stuff like, you know, a blacksmith courted me a long time, he wooed me. With his hammer in his hand, he looked so clever. Again, the tools become metonymous. My little carpenter, uh, he works with his broad axe all day. He sits by me all night. Work songs fascinating here, because I think, whereas the external view um, of the workman is if not negative, it's failing to um, suggest that anything they want to do is, you know, get on with their job. You know, the elite view is, well, give them half a chance and they'll skype off and get drunk. We'll get a bit more of that later on. But the, the folk songs are always very, very brisk about identifying happiness with what you do. Um, you don't just marry a boy who happens to be doing something. You marry a blacksmith, you marry a carpenter, there are massively detailed songs. There's a wonderful one from the Somerset Colliers in which 18 verses, totally unintelligible to anyone who isn't an 18th century Somerset Collier because it's full of basically where dialect meets trade idiom, um, end up by telling you how very happy they all are. Right down to the 1930s in the South Wales villages, um, the boys were kind of marching down the street singing, you know, to the pit I want to go away from school and all its woe, working as a college, but he will make all of us extremely happy. There's a wonderful version of um, a courting poem, um, interestingly subverted from the original, um, to suit not only um, the coal fields, but also the interests of combination in the coal fields, because um, the milkmaid, of course, he has to be a milkmaid. This is one of those, you know, John meets Sally out in the woods and away they go. But before she goes away with him into the woods, she checks out, and are you a collier? Yes. Are you one of the brave union boys 
Yes, old, he says, that's fine. My father's a pitman, my brother gets down the pit, that's fine, off we go into the woods together. Um, but the whole poem is based on the praise of the colliers, the collier lads who go into the pub, who spend their money, who don't care, and who then go down the pit regardless of the stormy winds, at which point you realise this has actually been plagiarised from what is originally a ballad in praise of fishermen and simply transferred from one trade to another um, with a vested interest, obviously, coming from somebody who wants to promote the unionisation. And this is a way of thinking that actually is rooted in an 18th century model of the trade. Um, it's vital to the trade that people enter, are apprenticed, receive their full status and remain in it. But it still continues into 1840s. Um, this, this here is, you know, for, firstly, this is an example of the, um, the tragic death epitaph. So um, the left-hand side here, my engine now is cold and still, is using exactly the same imagery as my sledge and hammer lie declined, um, probably imitated from it, but updating it for the world of the railway. Um, and then on the other side, you've got the tragic details. Again, you get a lot of this with minor epitaphs, exactly how they died. Um, the coals all burst around my head and sent me to my deathly bed. And that's just one of the shorter ones. But it's interesting that Whereas the opportunity should be present in a disaster epitaph to actually point the finger at the management who were presumably responsible for the low safety standards which led to the disaster in the first place. It seldom if ever happens. Instead, what you have is the kind of healing of the disaster by turning it into poetry. Um, a sense that once somebody has died, you know, in an industrial accident, your concern is not so much to protect future people, your concern is to make a poetic, a literary or a story form, which kind of covers over the disaster. And this is actually updated to the kind of, you know, early railway engines that we see on either side here. And railwaymen just about make it into the canon of traditional trades. Um, you, you look at Brookwood Cemetery, there's this wonderful area where they've got all of the railway graves together. Um, solidarity, probably union membership as well, in death as in life. But the railways are the last one. Um, even people who are kind of trying to write in the folk idiom, there, there's an absolutely wonderful tract which was handed out to large numbers of railmen who, you know, found a use for it as, as might, might or might be not necessary in lighting the coals. Tracts were distributed in absurd numbers, but they are written by people who are trying to touch the folk mind. And it's brilliant because it all begins with a picture of a guy connecting up the engine to the carriages with it's all in the coupling and then proceeds by using the work idiom for about two or three paragraphs to undergo however good looking your carriage may be if it is not coupled to the engine are you coupled to god so technology at that point is still capable of being absorbed within a kind of folk idiom but 1840 is the end of it because after that as technology develops it moves away and essentially what's happening is that the old trades were closed worlds. Uh, once you were in, you were a blacksmith, a carpenter, a collier, a railwayman, and you combined with others because that was the nature of your job. But as technology advances and you start moving into the late 19th century, people's capacity for work turns them into multiple hands. They, they are labor in both senses. They are not specifically who they are as a job identity. And the gradual erosion of the worker identity as a specific member of a trade by the worker identity, either from the point of view of the employers as hands, or from the point of view of the men, we're still talking men here, as members of a potentially combined and active working class, takes over from the older folk idiom. So like the midpoint of the 19th century is the swing at which a lot of the old world disappears. Although, you know, there are examples of it that carry on until much later. And the mines are kind of classic, you know, minor identity carried on until the bitter end. Precisely because you've got a physical demarcation. Um, people are going down into the pit. There's a brilliant account of this. Um, somebody's, you know, social history, very good one of the Yorkshire Pearl Fields. Obviously, the guy is 
you know, and it has to be a man because this is an all-male environment underground. Um, since 1842, which was the year that Lord Shaftesbury's Act actually stopped women working down in the pit, hauling the trolleys and so on, um, the boys become surrogate women. They have to do the cheap jobs that require unskilled labour and uh, have, need the strength. So they're essentially being initiated by this experience from teenage onwards. But because it's an all-male environment, they get into the pit, the, uh, the cage at the head of the pit, you know, first thing in the morning, still clean and everything, making their way down. The talk gets filthier and filthier as they descend down into the mine until you've got an environment of swearing, which is actually called pit talk, down at the bottom. And that is how you do your work. Um, and you're stripped of the waste, obviously. Uh, you're, you're in hot, demanding conditions. It's a completely unintelligible world to the people up at the top. And then at the end of the day, you get back in the cage. And it was observed that gradually, as the cage winches up, getting back up to the light, the talk becomes more and more polite uh, until when you know they reach the top, they're ready to go back and talk to their wives and girlfriends. And this demarcation between a work world and a specifically non-work, uh, a symbolically contrasted world is, is found in the superstitions, particularly the ones which are common between miners and fishermen. Now, some of the stuff with fishermen makes perfect sense. If you're going to work and you see a drowned animal, you turn back again because, you know, it's a bit unpleasant and you can see what the connection might be with you. But with both miners and fishermen, it was unlucky to meet a woman. Um, also, in both cases, you've got the continuing old tradition that it's unlucky to meet a priest. Well, the woman thing is because she belongs to the contrastive other. Um, she doesn't fit into your secret underground world. The priest thing, I think, is even more interesting for miners because by descending into effectively an underworld um, with all the noise, smells, sweat um, that you're going to get down there, they are becoming surrogate devils. It's not so perceptible. I mean, th this is a potential theme with some of the, um, the stories told about knockers and other mine spirits. But you do get a lot of this in other countries um, where the mine workers articulately identify themselves with the devil. Um, you know, and, and there, there are little devil figures underground in, in South American mines, precisely because they're flagging themselves up as living in an anti-world. So, so contrast is one of the factors that gets you solidarity. On the other hand, the other great thing about contrast is that a bunch of people you don't like. Um, as G.K. Chesterton said, you know, St. George for Mary England is never half as effective as strike bloody fro froggy Frenchman dead. So you get anti-trades um, like the tailors who specifically um, are associated with lack of masculinity. Nine tailors make a man. Um, so you get the, these wonderful two opposed folk idioms, the one in which tailors gang together but run away from a snail, uh, the one in which devil amongst the tailors is that, um, that game where you throw the ball in amongst the skittles and the tailors of course all scatter. Simultaneously, the tailors, who apart from anything else are traveling around from you know, house to house if they're itinerants um, and who are welcomed as storytellers. So they get a chance to do stories like the Manx one of the tailor and the bug end where he sits up in the ruined church all night. Um, and he's actually then preparing a pair of breeches. So, you know, typical bit of tailor law thrown into it. The stitches are put in at the right place at the right moment as the demonic thing gradually assembles itself and the last three stitches go in as the tailor makes a run for the door. Um, you've got the, um, the brave little tailor syndrome that you get in the Grimm stories. So, Blason against trades are part of the competitive narratives that people are putting together, um, but they're also part of self-identity. Um, tailors quite clearly enjoy telling heroic tailor stories precisely because they know it's kicking against the grain. The tailor, interestingly, appears as the villain um, in a classic blacksmith story, which is King Alfred and the Seven Trades. And this is one of these great justificatory trade stories which actually used to get recited once a year at the blacksmith's feast. King Alfred held a great feast um, and invited seven representatives of the principal trades to come to see who was gonna be the king of the trades. Um, and everyone turns up 
with his tool again. So the stonemason turns up with his chisel, the baker turns up with his iron peel and everything, the thing he used for putting the buns in the oven. Um, and, you know, the blacksmith obviously turns up with his hammer, but he's a bit mucky and, and King Alfred really doesn't feel that he's terribly impressive. Whereas the tailor has bought a wonderful, wonderful coat. Um, so gently slipping it on and having a look at himself in the mirror, King Alfred appoints the tailor the king of the trades. And the other is a bit pissed off. The blacksmith simply goes back in a huff and pours a bit of water on the forge. And then it goes on. They can't do anything. Everybody's tools get blunt. They can't work. They realize they need the tools of the blacksmith. They go into the forge. There's a bit of slapstick where they try to get the forge working. And of course, they don't know how to do it. So they're all falling each over each other. And then arrives the blacksmith, puts everything right. Um, and then putting on his apron, makes everybody's tools sharp again, and is appointed king of the trades to the great satisfaction of everybody, apart from the tailor, who creeps underneath and cuts little slashes in the bottom of his apron. And that's why blacksmiths wear jagged aprons. And when they are not wearing their jagged aprons, this, this one on the right seems to be quite effective, they are going on procession with old Clem. Old Clem, and, and all of these trade um, epitome figures, um, usually have a name which began as a saint, Obviously, initially, he's St. Clement with a feast day on the 23rd November. Um, but they're keen at this point to lose the hint of Catholicism. So he becomes Old Clem. Um, this is, I think, Chatham. Um, there's a guy dressed up. So, so they've obviously got somebody in a false beard um, carrying the hammer and tongs. God knows how they got that anvil on a platform, but blacksmiths are fairly strong men, as you can see. And they're carrying him around and essentially soliciting contributions, which they can then lose in drink. So they are prepared to uh, make a feast day of it. In the old clog almanacs, the emblem for St. Clement's Day uh, was a jug in the margin, giving you an idea about what they're up to. Um, in other cases, they actually make a model old Clem. So essentially, this is the same sort of um, practice as you get in taking round a guy, including, you know, the use of it as kind of, we've done something creative, now can we have some money, please? But as a folk custom, um, you know, so, so, you know, in high Victorian, you're looking at something which is a ritualized custom, but has much less of what we, and we may have to kind of confront some of our prejudices here, um, think of as folk earlier on, because the records from 1800 in the dockyards at Woolwich, where obviously like the blacksmiths are key workers. One of the points about the story of King Alfred and the trades is that the blacksmith just doesn't have a task, a job. He has a bottleneck job. Nobody else can work unless he provides him with the tools. So obviously he's got a stranglehold on production, looking at it from you know, an economic point of view. All of the, the bottleneck trades are immensely proud of their status as the one indispensable part in a process of production. And at Woolwich, because it's actually in kind of, you know, the government dockyards, the government armories, um, it's more indispensable. And so when they used to have the St. Clement procession, it wasn't just kind of, you know, we'll get a guy to dress up and, and look funny. Um, it was actually dignified figures on horseback representing the head of the profession going around and they stop at various points and are completely non-folk from our point of view, poet, deeply classical, all sorts of references to Vulcan and to Lucane is recited. And that's how they promote their, promote their trade identity. Now, the same thing applies to the cobblers, cobblers and shoemakers. And it's always lethal to refer to a shoemaker as a cobbler if you ever want him to talk to you again. The sons of Crispin, uh, because King Crispin began his life as Saint Crispin, one of the two shoemaker brothers, Crispin and Crispinianus. Um, who were adopted again in a typically Catholic arrangement, whereby each trade needs to have its emblematic figure, which is either kind of imposed from top down or simply picked out from the saints' lives. For all we know, the original historic Crispin and Crispinianus really were shoemakers, but they become the patrons of the gentle craft. And it's well known that they lived in Faversham, um, if you live in Faversham. Um, otherwise, they are actually supposed to be members of the early Roman aristocracy. Now, the same kind of process leading to um, a folkish ritualized version of what is earlier a civic ritual um, appears in the poems 
and the, the processions involving Crispin. Because in 1613, at Wells, um, general neighborhood of streets, so in a shoemaking area, we find that the Cobblers Guild uh, performing a play in 1613 where you've got, you know, speeches, magnificence, the routine of late medieval guild procession. And gradually, you can see this still being taken up in 1777 in Suffolk. Um, there are two dignified figures followed by the nobility of King Crispin, um, dressed interestingly in the best possible clothes, but all in leather, which must have been an interesting sight. In 1832 in Nantwich, there is still a procession um, in which they are at the head of a cavalcade and they're looking as grand as they can. And they're being followed by a representative sample of gentlemen's boots and ladies' shoes, um, just as in the, um, the letter heading here. But then after that, it makes its way down the social scale. And Crispin's day, with a little bit of kind of help in the Battle of Agincourt, becomes, you know, the cobbler's holiday, the day when all the cobblers go out and get drunk. And what's happened, of course, is the status of the craft has fallen with the late 19th century diminution in the powers of labor. Um, the cobblers are no longer anything like as dignified as they were. And this is a, a procedure you get in all of these, where once there were essentially vertically organized um, social groupings, so that all of the cobblers, all of the blacksmiths, whether poor or rich, belong to a single trade, um, and the master and the apprentice and the journeyman all march in the same procession. And they then each have a guild, as per London livery companies, which distinguishes them from the other trades. And this is still the mentality which folk performance tries to keep up at a more you know, humble level when you're begging for the, uh, the wherewithal to have a feast rather than inviting people to the feast that you have as a craft. On the other hand, what's happening in the 19th century is that people are moving towards a horizontal social structure um, in which there are workers who receive their materials, um, their orders effectively in both senses of the word from a management who had nothing to do with the trade, who are simply you know, gentlemen capitalist investors. That's a change which cuts across the old folklore way of thinking about unified trades. And the consequence, once you come to social unrest, is that the emblematic figure, um, the Clement, the Crispin, is replaced by the Ned Ludd, who is simply another um, trade fict. Um, he is the imaginary leader um, who takes his men, not now in pursuit of their status as members of the craft, but in pursuit of their rights. And this is one of the few occasions where the emblematic figure actually cuts across from male to female employment. Um, these are the lace makers about which David Hopkin has said almost as much as Paul Cowdell has said about old Clem. So I'm, I'm drawing very much on other people's ideas here. But whereas the medieval patron, and of course still the continental patron of lace makers is St. Catherine um, in England, which is pretty much at the, uh, the borders of the trade anyway, she becomes replaced by Queen Catherine. So as with Crispin, you know, Saint, Saint to monarch, except in this case, England has literally had a Queen Catherine. So Catherine of Aragon then becomes pressed from the history books into the folklore as the good lady. And the important thing about Catherine, the totally bogus story, which the loaf makers told, is that when times were hard and the girls were having difficulty earning a living, she nobly burned all of her lace. Um, so they, so obviously, everybody else at the court had no alternative. What do you do when the queen burns her lace? Well, you know, you line up with a match in your own lace just to show that you're joining in. And they all had to buy new, and behold, the lace making industry flourished. And this is a fascinating story, legend, because it shows not just wish fulfillment, but wish fulfillment within a particular frame of thinking about economics, um, what they call utopian consumption. And it's fascinating also because this is totally contrary to the theory of supply and demand, which we all accept as basically fundamentally economic reality. Um, you know, the market for lace is predicated on how many people want to buy lace. Uh, and once you've, everyone's bought lace, then, you know, you have to go off and make something else. Whereas in the utopian world, the job of the rich 
is to consume. That's what God put the rich on earth for. And they need to buy the goods that the poor make. Um, and if they don't want it, that's their problem. They need to burn their lace and buy more. The paradox is that just like other examples in which modern economy arrived and on the center stage and muscled out earlier mentalities of how the economy worked, the Elizabethan economy worked absolutely on the utopian principle. Um, when Queen Elizabeth was concerned about the fact that the, uh, the cap makers weren't getting enough money to support their trade, instead of telling them to go off and reskill and do something else, she passed a law making it compulsory for people to wear caps. Completely different way of thinking about work. The lace makers, of course, economically are on very, very poverty wages. They're, you know, marginal compared to the other trades we've been looking at. But nevertheless, they have their holiday. Um, St. Catherine's Day, they get together and have a procession. Um, and rather sweetly, the, um, the Peterborough, I think they, they're actually being trained in lace making. They're in the workhouse, which says a lot about, you know, the marginality. Um, but they go around the streets singing, um, a spinning we will go, a spinning we will go, definitely modeled on a hunting we will go and showing, you know, the appropriation of masculinities for the purpose of talking about yourself as a work guild. So the language of proving who you are and solidarity is already available. Um, at the beginning of the 19th century, late 80s, early 90s, when the, the friendly societies are being put together. The ancient order of foresters, I have to say, is very much with us. Um, headquarters in Southampton and a rather nice museum of which this is only one bit of forest of Ling. And I was lucky enough, um, there is a branch where I am in Epsom. Um, I just missed the opportunity of being brother heart. Um, I, I was offered membership, but then I, I discovered that, you know, the NHS actually offers a better deal at the moment. You can get quite nice benefits with the foresters, but before you join, you still have to get one of the old wooden axes. Um, and then another bloke grabs the wooden axe and you have a, a little tussle. Um, and having proved that you are a strong and honest forester, you're then admitted and, and you become a brother and you work your way through the grades. Originally, everybody tells you this is like the meta folklore. You do the folkloric thing with the axes and then you're told the story about it. There's a kind of underlying, obviously an awful lot of friendly societies nicked as much as they could from the Freemasons who were kind of first on the, uh, the block with the idea of the emblematic actions and the moral interpretation. Um, the interpretation here is that the foresters, obviously because it's a benefit society and it pays out if you're ill, wanted to make sure that you were neither ill nor a weakling. So you had that, you know, you, and, and they always say, well, we now bang the axes a bit, but we used to have a real fight. Um, so that you could prove that you're a tough guy um, and you weren't going to be a charge on their uh, benefit fund anytime soon. But the language that is used and, and you know, Forrester Bling goes on and on. There are the sashes, uh, there are little things you wear around your neck when, you, when you're for a committee meeting. There are little black things you wear around your neck when you go to a funeral. There are the banners, all of this and is produced um, by, by, you know, companies who are providing all of the, um, the friendly societies across the country with similar, there is a, there is a museum um, subject specialist group collecting this stuff. Um, all of it done on the same lines with the same sort of two sterling idiomatic chats. And all of it, of course, based on a, a financial reality, but it works because it's clothed in ritual language. There's nothing better than joining up as, you know, an organization where you get to dress as Robin Hood and go out on the streets a lot. What I love is the way that unions, whereas you can see the culture of the banners, the culture of solidarity, um, originally, certainly, a lot of the early unions are nicking, again, Masonic ritual ideas and also Masonic language about the benefits of brotherhood and unity and, and the fact that everybody has a duty to be social, to help each other. Um, obviously, this is a Nottingham section, so they have a specialist interest in Robin Hood. Um, as, as you know, the concern with health and safety might possibly suggest is a slight, slightly more modern than the Forester's Banner, but they're still using the same visual um, and more importantly, a lot of the same symbolic language to create solidarity. Now, the great advantage about this sort of thing is that if you're in one of the bottleneck trades, um, you're going to be able to command things. These are the wool combers, and they stand at the head of the textile process. 
um, if you're talking about the manufacture of woolens, the wool's got to be combed before anything else happens. So they represent, certainly late 80s, early 90s, one of the more powerful trade confederacies. And they express this in the St. Blaise procession. No, Bishop Blaise, the original Saint Blaise, who still has, you know, his continental cult, which has nothing to do basically with wool combing, he was martyred in the hagiography by being torn to pieces with um, wool combs, um, th those long spiky instruments that you, you straighten it out with. You know, it's one of those gruesome deaths which appeals in saints' lives. Totally lost in Protestant England, where instead he becomes the inventor of the wool comb, creating the trade of the wool combers, and therefore the Bishop Lay's procession, which are recorded from at least 1777, either in the, um, the East Anglian, old woolen industry towns, or migrating with great success um, to the northern Yorkshire and Lancashire textile towns. This is like the big event of the year. It's in February. And um, so you've got the opportunity to, you know, nothing else to do in trade and people go out and be working. The, the processions go on and on. Uh, this is only like, you know, a fragment of a long rollout banner, which is just to tell you how wonderful it was. Um, this, in fact, is, is the Bradford 1811 one, which tragically is one of the last really big Bishop Blaise processions before the great 1821 strike, in which the combined power of the wool combers was essentially broken by the management. They were forced down onto lower wages. They lost their unity as a trade. And of course, all this sort of ritualized activity went by the board. Blaise himself is emblematic. They're not awfully bothered about him. I mean, you know, Jason will do quite nicely. Um, he appears with the Golden Fleece, obviously, that's how he comes in, um, in the processions. Um, Jack of Newbury, um, the legendary Reading clothier, is also introduced. So even the good manager becomes potentially part of the story. And the, the good bishop himself, of course, has been revived several times. Um, the Bradford pageant realized that, you know, they needed to have an emblematic figure. He was used, and this, this again is the, you know, the dangerous ground between survival and revival. He continued to be present as a, a potential leader of processions um, in all sorts of circumstances. You know, he, he loses some of his connection with the wool trade once he becomes a good way to kind of get people together um, in an organized march. So the march in Coventry against Catholic emancipation is headed illogically by the former St. Blaise. Um, the march in 1834 in Tavistock, um, a town which had, by then was losing any connection it had ever had with the woolen industry and starting to pick up on the, um, the metal market. Um, that, that again is headed by Blaise because he's become the emblematic processional figure. So how do you get to become a member of one of these ingrained, clannish, deeply identified, unified trades. Well, this is one of the problems because once you're apprentice and if there's no work, you may have to go on the tramp. Stonemasons are, as far as we can gather, you know, th this is potentially the, um, the narrative which is at the base of operative rather than speculative masonry. Um, Stonemasons had to go where the job was. If somebody isn't building a church, you go where they're building a church. Yes, we're used to the idea of mobile workmen. What we don't realize, I think now, is how incredibly organized it was because there are records from houses of call. A house of call was somewhere where if you had union papers, you went and handed them over. Um, it worked very well for the masons. It worked very well for the carpenters. It didn't work so well for the printers because like they were printers, they could forge their own union papers. Um, so there, there was a lot of work done into, again, knowing what people, you know, had as way connections. But once you were there, you could go on the tramp, which has a completely different sense from, you know, the tramp as we think of him, making your way around. And this is why there are lots of pubs called the Mason's Arms, the Carpenter's Arms. Um, they have got that folk status as houses of call. And you realize now, when you're kind of looking at the circulation, I was talking earlier about, you know, how do they copy the blacksmith's epitaph from one part of the country to another? The mileage that people could pick up going on the tram, which was essentially a rational response to unemployment. You just carried on walking until you found somewhere where there was a permanent job. You could end up doing the whole circuit 
uh, which could be 1,200, 2,000 miles before you ended up back to where you started. Obviously, it's a young man thing. It's a pre-family stage in your life cycle. Um, but you're making your way around and you need to find out whether people are going to accept you. You rely on the solidarity of the union to actually get you your status as a stonemason. Interestingly, one of the accounts with, um, you know, less formally talks about the procedure of throwing the cap in, which exists in two forms. Um, one of which is a bloke who's been out on a bender and, and is by no means certain whether his wife is going to be all that happy to see him back home again. So the first thing he does is throw his cap into the house. And if it comes whizzing out again, he goes back to the pub. But the equally common version is that this is actually the apprentice or the journeyman who wants to join a lodge or a group of his fellow workers and who again throws in the cap. Um, and if it comes out again, he carries on tramping because he realizes, you know, they don't like strangers. They may not have any more work available in the area. So there's kind of opposition between the folk narratives of how to travel and join, carrying obviously the law of different counties around with them, um, and the equally traditional xenophobic narratives um, of people like the Portland stonemason. Um, who, who actually stood on top of the Rock of Portland, armed with stone, which takes a large amount on the Rock of Portland, and hurled it at anyone who tried to come over and join the quarryman industry. And then they got on with building basically most of London out of a single island all by themselves. Portland is a, the extreme example um, of the, the trade and the society as a unity. As far as I'm aware, nobody on Portland ever did anything else apart from be a stonemason. So much so that in the, um, the 18th century, visitors to the island just assumed that their ability to haul huge amounts of um, Portland and Purbeck stone across the landscape was genetic. They were actually bred to it from being raised as a single population. So you're kind of thinking, how do you get to join a trade? Well, you have to be apprenticed. And then at the end of that, what you need is, again, the opposite of belonging is hostility to the outside. So in order to make your way from a semi-accepted outsider, which is you know, what the apprentice is, under rule, to a free and independent member of the trading community, um, you have to go through rituals. And this is trussing in the cooper. Essentially, you, by the time you can make a barrel, so once you can make a barrel like that, you know what you're doing. Um, you get into it. Um, immediately and triumphantly, they pour over you soot, beer, shavings, flour, more beer, until uh, the oldest instances, I think, are kind of, uh, there's very, very few before the 20th century. I mean, we assume they did it, but it's not recorded, possibly because it's a kind of private thing, except that uh, at the end of it, they, they turn the barrel over and tumble you around it a bit, and that you get, and after that, you're a fully fledged cooper. Um, the latest example I found online is 2021, uh, where the poor apprentice says, well, it's like being covered in all sorts of minginess. Uh, which I think sums it up. There's also, you know, like all of this stuff, how, how far do you want to go on the symbolic area? Um, there's the rebirth sense that you have to, like, uh, like a newborn, get yourself absolutely filthy and nasty. Um, obviously, you're in the, in the barrel, and then you're reborn, you get out of the barrel, somebody eventually very nicely hoses you down, and you're a clean member of the community. The, uh, the printer equipment, again, uh, down to the, uh, you know, down to the whopping crisis, printers remained an absolute bottleneck profession. Um, for all of the knowledge trades, if the printer says no, that was no. And they exploited, you know, as a union, um, that power that it gave them. But part of that was the continuing of customs like banging out the apprentice. Uh, in the, the banging out, and um, the, the stuff that the, um, the guy is handling is a form. Um, multiple form actually. I mean, the, the, the simpler ones are simply a frame in which you, you set the type and tighten it up so it stays steady. And it's a, a metal frame. So it's based, you know, if you hit it um, with a metal compositing tool, it makes a noise. If the entire chapel, printers are organized in chapels, um, all hit their form simultaneously, it makes a hell of a noise. Um, at which point you then pour all sorts of minginess over the apprentice. Printers have the great advantage over any other trade they've got printer's ink, so you're totally filthy, um, at which point they then take you out and tie you to a lamppost or rather an exposed location. This ritualized ribbing um, is part of the solidarity 
because not only have you been made as mucky as possible, you've gone along with it. Of course, the whole point of these initiatory rituals is to see that the apprentice can put up with a bit of ribbing, more than a bit in some cases, um, and they can go nasty in extreme. But the idea is that you've put up with it, you've been hazed, now you okay, you can join the others. And the slightly softer equivalent is the, um, the apprentice April Fool's joke, the glass hammer. Um, you send them off in search of a glass hammer. You send them off in search of striped paint. Um, you send them off in search of the left-handed screwdriver. Um, you send them off in search of the metric adjustable spanner. And not only do you send them to the shop for it, um, but the shop, having, you know, the shopkeeper's in on the joke. He's, he's done this loads of times before. Uh, it's interesting looking at people's reminiscence of this. Again, it's a, a kind of popular item in online chat shows. And it's like the same things year after year after year. And you do wonder to some extent, you know, everybody, including the apprentice, one imagines, is playing along with this. And the shopkeeper will send the apprentice on going, well, we, we haven't got a bubble for a spirit level here. But if you go to so-and-so down the other end of town and ask him, and so-and-so sends them on and so on until everybody's tired and, you know, it's five o'clock and the apprentice has got to knock off. Occasionally, I, you, you do feel, um, clearly in this case, the apprentice felt that it wouldn't be that difficult to get a glass hammer. Um, I bet you could probably buy them on eBay now, it spoils the whole point. Um, there's a classic example, which was in the, the glass blowing trade, where initially light bulbs had to be frosted um, and were frosted on the outside, pecked on the outside. Um, and so the glass hammer joke in the trade was to send somebody to get a light bulb frosted on the inside, uh, which worked until 1925 when the apprentice, who was actually, you know, a craftsman with some previous experience, returned with the first light bulb done the way they are now and said, here you are, you asked for it and you got it. So solidarity is created by testing. One of the interesting things about the Yorkshire miners, again, a long tradition, is bonding through fairly vicious joking. Um, I mean, a lot of the fun was pushing guys just by ribbing them or mocking them as far as they can go. And a lot, a lot of this, you know, a bit like the time people for lampposts, usually somebody is stripped. There's nothing like men stripping each other and then being rude about each other's pricks to, you know, promote heteronormative solidarity. And the justification, because, you know, after a while, somebody actually did the kind of sociology thing and said to the miners, well, yeah, you know, What's in it? You know, you, you, you really wound him up. He's supposed to be your mate. And it's like, yeah, but I've got to be able to trust him. Um, you know, if he blows out, if he can't take a joke, how do I know that when there's an accident underground and I need everything that he can offer and he's got to actually support me, um, that he isn't going to actually be reliable then? So consciously or semi-consciously, a lot of the, um, the folklore behind apprentice jokes, behind testing, behind, behind you know, traditional but rather sharp humour is actually reliability in a crisis. And the other thing that is essential to all of these events is pouring as much drink down yourself and all your mates as you can. Um, this is a lovely illustration from a sequence, I think, of six, um, published in Birmingham, uh, and it's the adventures of a bagman. He, he's the bloke wearing the, uh, the, the natty, yellow, you know, natty blue jacket um, in Picture Centre. Uh, and of course, he has paid for all the wine and everybody else is either knocking down or throwing up because he's arrived, he's a new member of the company. This is called Colting. And in fact, in the original picture, there's a very large, um, above the, uh, the fireplace, painting of a colt being shot. So he is the ritual young man. It's his job to be treated as an inferior who's you know, gonna pay for drinks all round. And yet, simultaneously, the importance of the drink is that it's achieving solidarity. Everyone's getting sloshed together, um, yes, obviously, it's an all-male gathering of fellow bagmen, um, apart from the dog, um, and that's how they're going to be able to trust each other. And the satirical version is that none of this is actually doing any good. In fact, the rest of the picture sequence is about how he completely fails to do any business and returns home. What happens when you move into the culture of the mid to late 19th century? is you start getting resistance to what had presumably been standard workshop practice. Um, so there, there's a lovely diary uh, written by a bloke called James Hopkinson. Um, 
who goes to Derby. He's a, a, he's a chapel goer. He's a very moral young man. He sees street football in Derby and says, I cannot imagine why they are making so much fuss about people who are good at like, you know, kicking a ball up and down the street and getting it away from other people. Um, and he's trained by his father as a cabinet maker. So he goes and joins. And then he realizes that he has to pay. Um, so like different rates applied in different jobs. Um, but the kind of standard is that you paid for a gallon of ale. Everybody else contributes a pint of ale per person. Um, at midday, work stops, and you make your way back and you share it out in the pub. Well, you know, the advantage from the point of view of solidarity within the community is obvious. Um, simultaneously, it's the sort of stuff that not only offends, you know, earnest young men like Hopkinson, but is liable to have the managers tearing their hair out because they're, they're, they're losing labour. From the point of view of the, the trade, it's more important to ensure that firstly, newcomers understand that they are not yet fully fledged members. They have to do something. And obviously commensality, um, you know, sitting down and drinking with somebody, having a feast with somebody is the best way that you can join a community. The solidarity is actually taking an edge, which, you know, is more important than output. So much so that um, coming back to Chatham, in things like the shipwrights trade, a group of men would insist that they were paid their wages collectively. Um, there was trade and union resistance at that point to the idea that people should be paid independent individual wages. So the thing about paying individual wages is that suddenly the solidarity of the group is broken. It becomes obvious who's working more and who's working less, which is exactly what management want. Um, but which is opposed. So we're moving, you know, we're on the boundaries here between folklore and folk custom and mentality itself. To the extent that customs like allocating in, in, in the hatters and other trades, allocating the share of the total produce of the workshop by lot were made very important. The group is seen as having a priority over the individual. And of course, they all go off and, uh, you know, the, this is St. Monday. Um, this is the one day on which everybody abstains from work if they can. Um, it's actually Saint Lundi because you, you, you can see it. So wine rather than beer is in evidence. It was such a lovely French picture that it made a point. I couldn't resist including it. This is the, um, the pre-industrial time use. This is, this is the model of time um, which you know, existed before work discipline. Um, yeah, which anyone in the gig economy will now recognize as existing after industrialism. Um, work is not capable in both the folk mind and in the pre-industrial econo economy of indefinite expansion. You cannot just carry on producing more cabinets. You cannot carry on producing more ships. There is a limit to the number of these things that you can come up with. And therefore, once you know how much you need to do, you don't actually have to turn up and clock on for a regular nine to five. Um, what you do is you figure out how much you need to do in order to get the money. You work like fury from, from Bailden up, up in Yorkshire. There's a wonderful poacher's song. And basically the guy is a poacher. That's what he likes doing. Unfortunately, he has a job. Um, but fortunately, this is at an era when he isn't actually bound to, you know, the time that his boss wants him to work. So he goes out mucking around all day, works like fury at piecework on Friday, gets the money in. Um, goes to bed on Sunday, and on Monday, blessed St. Monday, goes out and drinks with them. And, you know, the, the negative perception with, 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 you know, nothing but booze sloshing around is, is that very much put around by the bosses. On the other hand, this is interesting. This is one of the rare occasions I come across where you've got a St. Monday picture. This is um, family parties uh, at the windmill, um, which is actually, basically, you look at it, it's a Victorian weekend. Of course, the classic thing here is you couldn't do anything on Sunday. So your weekend um, became the Monday. And the struggle um, as industrial time discipline takes over is between St. Monday, which is the workers' way of doing it. And you know, the, the whole entertainment economy, you know, see, see waiter on the left-hand side of the picture is geared up to supplying this. Um, and the Saturday half holiday, which management actually offers in order to wean people onto some kind of a regular time frame, um, and which, you know was offered very, very grudgingly. I mean, definitely as a half holiday, not a whole day off. And quite frequently with other days um, being, you know, other hours being added for the rest of your week. 
And the interesting thing here is that although St. Monday is in all the folklore books as, you know, a popular custom, um, yes, they used to sky off with a distinct impression that, you know, ho-ho, all down the pub. When you actually look at um, industrial centres like Birmingham, they're, they're opening the museums, they're opening the parks, they're, they're laying on cultural events on the Monday. They're just treating it very much as the weekend. So you've got two worlds. Um, and this is the point at which the divergence begins to happen between the boss's world and the workers' world. Very much to the fore in the navvies. Um, these are the constructors of essentially railway lines, you know, the, the major earthworks, originally the canals, carrying on through the great railway boom, through into the late 19th century with declining labor as the, the last railway lines were being created. And of course, these guys are folk devils and moral panics rolled up into one. Um, they arrive in large numbers. Um, they are associated with women who show no sign of being married to them. Um, they live in squalid accommodation because A, nobody's going to give them anything else and B, it has to be locked up next to where the railway line is. Um, and yes, you know, they, they, they are in the habit of using strong language um, and strong work. The navvies themselves, and there are records from essentially proto-social workers who, who actually get in amongst the community and see them as they see themselves. Yes, not a trade combination in any way, and they were employed by gangers, but they have the typical marks of a micro community. One of which um, is this fascinating, I think always found either in small communities or in trade micro communities. Um, everybody has a name which is nothing to do with the name on his birth certificate. Um, so you get the kind of classic story told to a navvy, but actually told to a lot of villagers elsewhere. Um, of, of the guy who turns around going, oh, I've got something here for John Smith. It's, uh, oh, no, 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 I'm not here, not here, no, no, not working on this guy. No, he tried the one down the road until eventually um, the girl who is, you know, leading him around and acting as his kind of initiator into Navi culture goes, oh, John, that's old Blackbird. Why don't you ask for old Blackbird? He's my dad. And that, you know, again, this is again a meta folklore story a story about naming traditions, which I think you'll, you'll find told in one shape or another of anywhere where you know, everybody is known by a name, which isn't the one that they got the job with. And of course, the thing about being a navvy is that it was an initiatory right in itself because you left your home, you left everything behind, you took on a new identity. The rough and tough thing was part of that communal identity. And the names are absolutely brilliant. Um, coffee Joe was not called because he drank coffee, but because, you know, he would have drank virtually anything that uh, had alcohol in it before any coffee was taken down. Um, Contrary York, and they're all called after where they come from, uh, comes from Yorkshire, obviously like Nat Nav is a you know, typical kind of international, inter you know, generally international, certainly um, different English counties, working community. Um, and he's contrary precisely because that's how he was. Rainbow Peck. Um, peg, not, not as in Peggy, but, you know, he's got a peg leg. But of course, so many of them have peg legs due to the lack of health and safety um, that he, this one had to be distinguished by the fact that not only did he have a wooden leg, but he had one that was so, cut, you know, badly made that it bowed into an arc when he put his weight on it. You see the sort of thing they're doing. And, you know, we're looking here at folk cultures, which are not just different from the elite cultures, but which are based on totally different principles. Uh, this is Hogarth's famous um, idle and industrious apprentice. And this is the elite view, that, that naughty, naughty idle apprentice. Whereas there's an awful lot of folk tradition, which is telling us actually the villain is the industrious apprentice. Why is he the villain? Because he's being too bloody keen. Um, the more he works, this again is, you know, the theory of the limited good. Um, there is only so much work to go around, there are only so many customers, there's only so much cloth you can weave, only so many cabinets you can make, all that sort of thing. Um, so the young man who's dead keen and rushes ahead and works overtime um, is actually going to, you know, cause a lot of ruckus and somebody's going to have to take him to one side and say, look, lad, just be a bit less, you know, turn up to work a little bit later, don't work so hard, otherwise you're showing everybody else up. And because he's young, he can work harder. Therefore, in order to have justice amongst, you know, a mixed age group um, in the working community, 
it's necessary to actually reach a kind of optimum level of production from everybody. And you get this even again in, in gravestones. People who work too hard and burst a blood vessel are buried under signs saying, do not glory in your strength. So custom, the dockers, contrary to what management might want, assume they have a right to pick up anything from a broken parcel that drops. So custom, um, the weavers have not just um, a rate, but a standard rate of embezzlement. So it's agreed how much cloth they're going to nick in advance. Um, folk custom, the shipwrights and the carpenters, certainly in, in Chatham, Woolwich, you know, the big yards, has a standard rate of a chip. Is, is not, as we might think, a, a bit of a shaving. A chip is a piece of wood too small to be noticed. Um, and the official limit um, set by the Admiralty, by you know, how small a bit of wood had to be to be small, was a yard, 36 inches. Uh, which means that in the working class districts of Chatham, all of the houses were built out of 35 inch long pieces of wood, ingeniously dovetailed together in leisure hours. For custom, the Mendip miners, lead miners, again, solidarity showed more by, by laws, were in the habit, uh, firstly, of claiming their mines. Obviously, each miner works individually or in a, in a very small group. Um, so they have to adjudicate and this is in the middle of a, a wild and mountainous country where, you know, the state has not got the facilities to do anything. A man digs a pit waist high, stands in it, hurls his hack, um, which is his pickaxe, as far as it will go in one direction and as far as it will go in the other, makes a mark where it landed, and within that area nobody else is allowed to sink a mine. Rough justice, very folk, I mean this is an international motif, claiming land by hurling or shooting something, Awful lot of stuff in, in Scandinavian tradition about how you claim farmland in exactly the same way, but clearly workable, even rougher justice, but articulated in, in the written rules of the Mendip miners was the burning of the hill in which somebody who had actually um, stolen goods, they say worth more than 13 pence acre, um, was locked in his hut with his tools, um, furs and broom and brushwood piled up around the hut, everything was set fire to, and if he could break his way out and escape, that was all right, as long as he left Mendip. And if he couldn't break his way out, well, that was no problem because he wasn't going to do any more thieving. Um, the consequence of which was that miners on the Mendip Hills could leave their tools lying around in the open, safe in the knowledge that nobody else would dare steal them. But justice, the hatters had their own rituals for convening a court. Um, you rang a bell or you, and, you know, what had been a workshop a moment ago became a court of the trade for small offences, with larger offences taken care of by dozen, um, which is where 12 workshops got together. Notice the kind of, you know, the model of the English jury and each appointed somebody, totally independent with the laws of the land, which of course they had to be, because um, under the Combination Acts, forming any kind of a union and including the, these trade courts um, was illegal. So justice, the skimmity riding the stank. In this case, you know, the young man banging on the pan appears to have made himself comfortable. Of course, the purpose of carrying somebody on a pole, especially a, a sharp ridged pole, is to make him as damn uncomfortable as possible. Um, the weavers had a special version of this in which not only did they carry somebody on a pole for as far as possible until it got very uncomfortable between the legs, but they took the beam out of his loom if he'd been a black leg. So at Stroud, when they were on strike, um, you know, there were black legs who were taken on the poles and then dumped in a pond, so they're getting people mucky with the game of life. Metonymic folk justice, um, and, and this is in the printing trade, the chapel ghost. When Benjamin Franklin actually um, came over from America to work as a printer in London in um, 1726, um, he joins a chapel, um, he pays them sixpence for the foot ale, um, they appoint him a bit later, he jibs at having to pay another sixpence to be reinitiated all over again, just because he's moved up a grade within the same organization. You know, so Ben, of course, is very much an individualist. The American thing is playing out here. Um, he's not looking at it from the point of view of mass solidarity. Um, he drinks water instead of beer. Um, he does point out that his fellow workers who were getting through six pints a day were not quite as accurate in their compositing as he was. Um, and he's assaulted by the chapel ghost. The chapel ghost used to move his tools to places where he couldn't find them. The chapel ghost used to upset his type. 
and the top of the ghost used to make things a bit mucky when he needed to pick them up, you know, printer's ink on the wrong side. Deary me, who could possibly have done these things? Only the chapel ghost. So here we see folklore actually being employed not as an expression, but as a tool. Nobody has to believe in the chapel ghost, but they have to talk about it because that's the way in which they're going to impose work discipline. It's the way in which the, um, the group, the set of men who have an identity in common as printers and have the advantage again of being in a bottleneck trade, so they can do what they like with one of their own, discipline people from the outside. So from the outside, it looks exclusive, but from the inside, it's trade solidarity. And that's what kept them going. Well, I'm running close to it to a time limit here, and I know people have got questions they want to ask. So I'll stop share here. And if, if Caroline and Martin are okay between the two of them, we, we can move on to a bit of dialogue. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. That was uh, really very interesting. Um, we had a few questions come up through the whole time. I think we'll go, should we go back to the beginning? And, oh yes, we ought to have a little bit of applause, Caroline is suggesting, yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good. Um, right, go back to early on. If I just ask you, um, you'll remember what question you were asking, but I can remind you. And if you, if I name you, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. So can we start with Sophia Kingshill, please? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Sophia, you yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, it was about the blacksmith's cap. You said we can we can tell from his cap that he's a, gre a green blacksmith, or words to that effect. How? What? Suspiciously like a tam o shanter to me. Uh, why? Do, yeah, and uh, so so it, it, oh, it's yeah, so he's Scottish. A round Scottish cap. Yeah. So if, and, it, and the fl the flat backs are manufactured in the potteries. <laughs> Okay, um, okay, yeah, 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 okay, right, thank you, thank they're, you, that they're, was a... They're given, they're given to Scottish figures, um, one of the couple you can get is the Highlander and his wife, um, who are painted in tartan with a dead deer on the knees of one of them. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, Caroline, you actually asked the next, next question. Um, would you like to... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm all turned on now. <laughs> were the women and children down mines treated as honorary men where pit talk was concerned, or did you know did the men make allowances for the fact that there were women and children there? We don't know because all of the evidence is from the commissions of inquiry, um, which are, are, are deeply concerned to show how desperately immoral and everything it is. So it, it's one of those kind of reading between the lines. My, you know, because um, the commissioners who were sent down in, in order to stop the, the employment of women underground. Um, was this the point, 1841 Act? Yeah, yeah. Um, make a point that they're going down there and the men are naked and, you know, how can we expect anyone to have a decent home life with circumstances like this? What they don't have is whether, in fact, there were kind of accommodation strategies. Mm -hmm. which there right. might well have been. We haven't got the oral history from the period. The interesting people are the, um, the pit girls um, and, and the Cornish bow maidens, um, who definitely do have, um, you know, a corporate identity, because obviously, like, they're working in the 20th century, so people get to photograph them and talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, they're, they're very proud of being working girls. Um, I don't think there's any specific law that's gathered from them. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Robert McDowell, you had a question about shipbuilding. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, thanks for a very sort of wide ranging, wide referenced um, presentation. Um, my question is around um, shipbuilding, which industrial shipbuilding, which 
ironically, I've started about the 1840s, where there were a lot of very specialist trades, carpenters, boiler makers, riveters, etc., which uh, existed through to what the 1960s, 70s. Um, did, did, did you come across any references to these in your uh, research, Jeremy? No. Um, well, once you move from wooden to metal ships, I haven't seen any ethnography um, amongst. I, I don't know what they. I mean, there might be something with kind of um, Harland and Wolf or the, or the Irish, you know, where where you would expect ethnographers to have gone out and worked with them. Sure. There, there's nothing I think from the time that's you know seeking you know correction by people who know better that's actually about them as a working community. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Christopher Hare, you had a question about miners and fishermen. I'm on now. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's very good uh, talk, Jeremy. Uh, so, so interesting. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering when you were talking about, you know, the change of trades, the, the breaking down of old solidarity, uh, people becoming um, employed in a more modern way. Um, and I wondered if another thing at play here in the decline of folk custom and also in folk song um, is the change in popular culture, I suppose, because of technology that that miners and fishermen were doing basically the same work in the 20th century as they were in the 19th. But I don't really know of any miners songs or fishermen songs, certainly after 1918, if not earlier. And of course, by the 20s, you've got, well, you've had the music hall late 19th century, the 20s, you've got cinema, you've got the gramophone recordings, music from America. Is the, the nationalising of culture and then the internationalising of culture, is that working to break down these small solidarity groups as well, do you think? Yes, definitely. I mean, the thing that breaks it down is any kind of fluidity, um, but both fluidity of capital and fluidity of labour. Um, you know, once, once, you know, the master becomes anybody who's bought a share, um, and once the labourers essentially become members of the working class who could do this or do that, I, the, the loss of song is one of those interesting things. Um, the, the other category of songs, and, and again, I, I don't know, because this is the, the dangerous boundary between songs and poetry. I mean, just because something's published as broad steep, you know, doesn't mean that anyone actually went out and sang it. Um, there are a lot of strike support songs that, that Roy collected, where they're, they're at the very least using a ballad idiom to put over their point. Um, and presumably being, you know, people are being organized to sing them. That's a completely different environment from people spontaneously coming out for stuff. Um, I don't know how many of the, you know, how happy I am to be in my job poems, which of course apply to agriculture as well. You know, you've got the Carter song, I whistle and sing, I'm as happy as a king. Um, you, you, you've got um, the farmers, you know, so jolly boys now, here's success to the plough. How many of them were, were sung in the kind of everybody down tools and burst out into a chorus? And how many of them more like declamatory verse? Um, like the stuff that they, they used to perform for the old Clem rituals. So the idea is that you stood up, so certainly with the, the, the blacksmiths, there's a very good, well, you, you, you know, of course, it's a Hampshire article, um, where at Twyford and a couple of other places, the blacksmith's feast was kept up with an official rendition of the blacksmith's legend. Um, so, so that it was still, you know, a performance um, ra rather than a folk song in the other sense. I'm, I'm also interested by work songs. Because I mean, okay, you, you, you've got the kind of the shanty type where you actually have to have the, the song. But most sorts of work don't seem to go any better for singing. Um, the, the lace makers, you know, David's written about the, the French lace makers songs, which again, aren't spontaneous, they're written for them. Uh, but the idea is it's so bloody boring, you know, and they're teenagers, at least they get to sing. Um, there's a balance in work song between celebrating how wonderful your job is and singing about it and singing because your job's so bloody boring. That, you know, you, you'd like at least to vary it by singing something. And I, and, you know, again, 
so, so much of what we've got is text and, and so, so little of what we've got is, is actual people who were there when it was happening. It's interesting, I just, just quickly, I just think, you know, the miners yeah. and all those miners songs, the Black Leg Miner, yeah. the various mine disaster songs of yeah. going right up to the early 1900s. Um, and, and the miners and strikes sang these songs and it's documented. We get to the 1984 miners strike and all we have is here we go, here we go, here yeah, we go, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the um, totality. Well, actually, the interesting people here are South African miners, um, because I, I remember actually, um, you know, see, 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 seeing uh, footage of a South African miners protest and the guys could sing. Mm. You know, they, they were in harmony and they got a halfway decent. Yeah, I, I um, obviously like this, this is a role for the Folklore Society. We, we should have a secret training camp on Salisbury Plain, you know, where, where you know, potential demonstrators are, are kind of, you know, locked up with EFTA's devotees and, and you know, told, taught, taught how to sing properly. <laughs> Good idea. Um, I just say that, uh, that in the Paul Cadell has put into the chat the point that I was actually going to make, um, the effort of Bert Lloyd and others to get the coal miners rewriting songs for themselves um, in the 1940s in particular, I think it was. Um, and a lot of those survived through the 60s and 70s. But as you say, you didn't hear many of them during the 80s. So um, the next question was from Ethan Doyle Wright. Um, could you ask your question, please, Ethan? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Hi, yeah. Yeah, thanks again. Jeremy, that was uh, interesting. Another interesting talk. I, I was kind of wanted to talk, ask about um, the afterlife of these sort of 18th, early 19th century uh, trade, trade football, and its its subsequent appropriation or reuse by people who aren't members of these trades, but who are claiming this sort of law for yeah. other other uses and other purposes. I mean, the thing I encountered in my sort of studies on on contemporary uh, cult movements was this appropriation, particularly post 1980s, of the Society of Horsemen, and this claiming of things and the law associated with the Society of Horsemen, kind of as a way of invoking a sense of authenticity and legitimacy, sort of by invoking the past and by saying we're connected to this past, even though these are sort of urbanites, suburbanites who have never worked with horses at all, but they're invoking this. And I wondered if how how common that sort of approach has been from from the from the mid 19th century on among communities who are who are not associated with those original trades but who are invoking it yeah yeah there, there, there are there are multiple strands um there's al almost you know we, which is like you know your thing the the contemporary ethnography of how people are using this stuff um there's my line as a, a more historical folklorist where, where yes, I, it, 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 it's, it's like those archaeologists who, who cheerfully dig through their way through the post medieval, chucking it to right and left, and you know, only cheer up when they reach the 11th century. Um, I do dig through my sources in search of the putative early 19th century, 18th century original. Um, but there's also kind of the, the, the linking factor, which is the historiography of folklore. Um, because I, I, you know, as I as I tackled this and some of the related topics, um, I was fascinated by the way that there was a, a 1980s, really, to early 90s, flourishing of socially engaged historical folklore, looking at these kind of working class micro communities. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the figures here are something like Sam Menefee and Wives for Sale, um, Bob Bushleyway and By Wright. Um, pulling with, with you know, not always due respect to the folklore society, pulling the historical material out of the apparently antiquarian matrix in which it had been reported and discussing it as an insight into functioning societies um, and obviously E.P. Thompson and customs in common. And then like in the early 90s, the whole thing suddenly kind of goes, ah, oh, that was fun. We're bored with that game. We'll go off and do something else. You know, whether the time is, is, is due for a revival of, of you know, the social interpretation of folkloric material. Um, but we're, you know, and also, you know, kind of coming back to, to what you're talking about, how we, um, 
distinguished revives, you know, a return of the scholarship, which obviously, like again, with Roy Palmer, is, is very much engaged. Um, he is motivated, was motivated by this material, was motivated by a sympathy with the working class blokes whose lives he was recording. Um, the difference between scholarship with motivation behind it um, and emotional participation with the gloss of scholarship um, is, is probably a bit of a sliding scale. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, nearly through the questions. Um, Sophia again had was not sure if this was a question, but would you like to ask you or not sure if you're a question? question? Um, it, it, it just struck me about uh, the thing about people being put into barrels and smeared with filth, uh, that that was quite like certain wedding, pre-wedding yes. customs yes. that we've heard about. And is yeah. it is it that is it that joining a trade is like getting married or is it that getting married is like joining a trade or does they like each other? It, it's, a, it's a language of getting people horribly muffy. Um, I think you could take it a bit further. Um, George Munger did that article on workplace rituals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, getting married is, 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 is a status change, if you like. So, you know, mm. I don't, you know, the danger here is you tend to pull things like, you know, rites of passage, you know, mm. out of your folkloric toolkit um, and, and, and firmly, you know, you use the spanner to do a, do a screwdriver's work. Um, but most, most of these, you know, let, let, let's ritually humiliate somebody in a very jolly manner and they'll go along with it. Um, Yes, they, they, they're marking, they're marking um, status changes, so therefore they belong to young people. Um, this is interesting because with all sorts of marriage folklore, um, you know, there's usually a modified version for those who get remarried later in life, where everybody sort of goes on, well, we all, you know, we ought to be doing the whole throwing the stocking thing and oh, whatever, you know, we'll have a quiet drink and they can go to bed. Um, in the same way, job movements, um, amongst people who are already mature craftsmen, you know, avoid any of this. So, so it's just a case of turning up, you know, buying a round of drinks, being accepted with the union card. Um, it, it's, it's becoming a fully fledged human being. It's ceasing to be, you know, a young person, you know, a teenager and becoming, you know, obviously ceasing to be a boy and becoming a man, you know, with these traits is the thing. And then that's probably the joining theme. Thank you. And of course, for sailors, the crossing the line ceremony. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Sophia. That's a very interesting point. Um, and finally, the last question was actually Caroline again. Speak up. Hello. I think you're spared because I've completely forgotten what I asked. Uh, shall I tell you? Yes. You asked, was that culting? Oh, yes, you mentioned a word and I just yeah. didn't catch it. Um, yeah. Culting. Yeah. Col culting, as, as in young horse. Um, yeah. it, I don't know. I mean, there are variations. I'm not sure whether it's variation by trade. Um, culting for the bagman. Um, footing seems to be fairly common. Um, presumably, like there's a common metaphor here with the shoeing horses. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you, you've also got these um, mock initiations like swearing on the horns and so on, um, where you've got customs which again involve the metaphor of the cult. So, you know, again, it's cult, cult into horse, you know, teenager into man. Um, yeah, Franklin actually says they called it they um, they called it being a bienvenu. So, so yeah, you see, London printers, you know, touch a glass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, that's great. Um, I don't think we've quite run out of steam yet. So has any, if anybody does have a question that has arisen, um, please raise your hand. That's your electronic hand, because we won't see the other one. Go to reactions. In the, the, this box has raised a non-electronic hand, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, no, there, please. Uh, yeah, 
I was yeah. just wondering if you could consider, for instance, the Jarrow March to be a continuation of the marching procession. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Because it just struck me as you were talking about it, yeah. that that was not a strike, it was a movement. Yes. Uh, which engendered a war. Yeah. Our there, there are, there are ritualised activities um, that you, you do when you're on a march. Um, a, a lot of the 1820s, 30s, 40s, um, they're raising sympathy. Um, bizarrely, it starts by um, miners hauling a barrel of coal with them. Um, and then um, weavers and iron founders start hauling a barrel of coal with them as well. And it's a sort of earnest of their um, integrity um, that they're hauling something valuable and not spending it and getting it on boots. And in fact, I think one, one of them is, is it the iron founders are stopped by a magistrate who's obviously a much better negotiator than the Peterloo kind, um, <laughs> who says, well, my good men, you know, I hear, I hear your complaint, uh, but, you know, it's really no good. You know, you're, you're away from home. You're, you're, you're not going away with this. Um, I will pay you, you know, I will pay you for, you for this coal, which will get you back home in comfort, uh, and then distributes the coal amongst the bystanders. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting stories. I mean, there, there are a lot of also um, swing riot stories. Um, passed down again in family tradition, but, but about the, the wise management of riot, which always turns out to be a ritualized wise management. But um, processions that do things, once you've, you know, once you've learned to organize yourself, uh, you know, and obviously things like the Bishop Blaze must have taken spectacular amounts of organizing. Um, but th that, that culture of, of theater carries on. There's a wonderful one from Birmingham in 1851, um, in the middle of a strike, which is over the, um, the truck system. So they're complaining about having to buy their food at the boss's shop with obviously the, at the boss's prices. Uh, truck has actually been illegal for 20 years, but the government isn't enforcing anything. Uh, please such not. Um, so they bury Tommy Truck. Um, you know, they put him in a coffin and they take him and one of the burliest blokes is actually hauled along to dress up as the widow Mrs. Truck and cry his eyes out, you know, into a large black cambric handkerchief. Uh, and a couple of the smaller ones are, are, you know, dressed up to be Thomas' children. So, so again, agitprop, um, the boundaries between your classical folklore and ahem, things that people do because they've heard that other people are doing them, uh, are, are more fluid than we think. Yeah, can, can I add an add on just to the, something else that you said earlier as well about the naming traditions mm. uh, amongst the navvies? Um, my uh, first husband, first second husband rather, was um, a prison officer, an ordinary prison officer at Army Jail, and they all had nicknames. Mm. Um, there was some uh, one of the managers was called Flower because he always referred to people as Flower. So when his son arrived to work there, they called him Petal. And um, there was somebody else called Minty because the shift started at quarter to eight and he always turned up after eight. Yeah. And a, another one was Binbag the jailer because he never washed his shirt. And when I was shown around the prison, because I was a liaison officer at one point from social security with them, um, I mentioned that my husband worked there. Um, they didn't know him under his correct name of Ken they knew him as Crazy Harry. Right. <laughs> yes. And what I, what, I, what I love about things like Flower and Petal is, you know, it's not just a nickname, but it's kind of like rhyming slang. You know, to, to be part of it, you have to know the reasons why it is the way it is. So, you know, they're, they're obviously, you know, a higher, a, you know, a higher and a deeper stage as you get further into this. Presumably, you know, I suppose the problem there is like if you're an outsider, you can you can figure out what people are called by kind of listening in on the conversation. So to prove that you're an inside insider, you have to know why they're called it. Okay, any other questions? Looks like we've reached the end, except I'd like to ask a question if I may. Um, I worked in a few factories in my career um, and one thing most of them and it's true of other communities as well had 
perhaps you'd call it the joker, perhaps it was the storyteller, perhaps it was um, the person who composed the songs for the special occasions. Is that something that's got much of a history? Have you noticed that anywhere? Yes, now, now you know, it's one of those classic, now that you mention it, I've, I've noticed it. Um, yes, you know, my, my mother had the same status as work, at work, you know, she was the one who came up with the works or, you know, between us, we did it. So, so you know, if somebody was leaving, we, we had to come up with the poetry for, for the, the leaving party. Um, yeah. um, and it's also, I like the way you say, you know, every factor had a joker. You know, it's kind of like every school has a fat boy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the social role is sitting there waiting for somebody to, to step into it. Right. I, I get the impression that goes back um, there's a wonderful story in Hugh Miller, and, and in the time available to me, I couldn't put my finger on which of its books um, it's in. But it, it, it is, it's a comic stonemason. Um, and, and he actually goes on the tram um, and arrives in, you know, he's, a, he's obviously Scots, arrives in a London stonemaker, stone yard, um, and kind of goes, well, will, will, will you take me on? And, and they kind of go, well, you know, got your papers, you know, can you cast stone? And you kind of, yeah, you know, give, give me a banker. And they say, well, like, okay, you know, we, we need a column. Um, and he sort of walks around tapping it um, with a claw hammer, um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, takes a bit off on Thursday, and they're kind of going, this guy, you know, you know, you know we, we, we've got a fraud on our hands going. And, and on Friday, he works like a demon, produces a perfect column and says, oh, that's how we do it in Scotland. <laughs> you know, very much that you know the Joker of the yard. Right, good, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, and, I'm and, going and, to and thanks for the spirit of the late Roy Barmer. Quite, um, he'd have loved it, I'm sure. Uh, perhaps we could give him a round of applause, please. And uh, just to say, um, next year's Roy Palmer lecture is on its way. Um, I won't say any more than that at the moment, except that next year we'll be looking at music of uh, in folk song. Um, and uh, thank you again to Jeremy. And thank you again to the Folklore Society for hosting this event. Very kind of you to do that, and it has taken a bit more work than usual for you, Caroline. <laughs> so, uh, I'll say I that again. <laughs> I, I'd like to apologise on behalf. That's of not your fault. COVID. It's COVID. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and would you like to tell people about finding the chat? Because there's so much good stuff in there. Yes, in the, the, the chat. If you just email us at the folklore society at gmail.com. Put that back in the chat here. I can email the, uh, the the text file to anybody who wants it, and there is quite a lot there. Okay. Oh. Well, I look forward to seeing some of you on the sixteenth of November for oh, yeah. the Catherine Briggs lecture. Do you want to just say to people who it who it is? It is. It's um. Our very own Ian Russell, Professor Ian Russell of the Elphinstone Institute, who's going to be talking about um, Peace of the World, Christmas caroling in the Hope Valley. And if you have a look at the Folklore Society's Eventbrite page, you can see the, uh, the, the you can get a ticket straight away there. And there's a bit more information about it on our website. And I'll put the, the, the website address that's here. Oh, I'll, there we go. I'll There's the website address. Or, I'll get my ticket organised straight away. All right, Thank so I'm going to stop recording now. There we okay. are. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Martin. Bye.